You're listening to The Other 50%, A Herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. Our presenting sponsor is the end-to-end production solution, GreenSlate. Whether it's start paperwork, time cards, purchase orders, or reports, everything is digital, everything is on the app, and you can work from wherever you are. GreenSlate offers full service to productions, including payroll, accounting software, and people, incentives management, ACA benefits, and now background casting and payroll through a partnership with Castify. The future is actually here. And if you'd like to hear this pitch in person or see it for yourself, call me as I am working there as the SVP of West Coast Operations. Here's my number, 310-789-2001, extension 323, or jhw at gslate.com. Now, back to my passion project. For today's episode, I spoke with Susie Singer Carter. Her website bio says this, if you asked five-year-old Susie what she wanted to be when she grew up, she'd have placed her hands defiantly on either side of her pink tutu and said, everything, duh. And that's what she has done. She is a writer, producer, actor, musician. She sat down and we became immediate friends and talked about everything. Marriage, divorce, parenting, daughtering. She recently made an autobiographical short film about Alzheimer's called My Mom and the Girl, which she'll tell us all about. And you can see her dancing hip hop on Facebook all the time. When I went to look us up, we had something like 79 friends in common. So it was high time we met each other. She has the media company called Go Girl Media, which I will link to on my website. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. And also the full season of Catch a Break, The Insider's Guide to Getting Into and Navigating Hollywood is now available on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places and on the website catchabreakpodcast.com. Go check out that one too. We're working on season two as we speak. All right, here's my conversation with Susie Singer Carter. Have a listen. Here's how we start. And I know you do a million things. I'm going to let you tell me. What do you do? Uh, Okay. Um, I am... Well, okay, now personally, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a, I'm a best friend, and um, professionally, I, I kind of am a tour because I write, I produce, I direct, I can act. <laughs> um, you hip-hop dance? I hip-hop dance. <laughs> I used to have a radio show. I used to DJ. I am, um, what else? I... Here's a here's a little nugget. I I used to, well my whole family's musical, so I grew up in the music industry. And um, when I was 19, Chuck Lorre, mm-hmm. the Chuck Lorre, when he was trying to become a a, a rock star, but it wasn't going to work. What we you know he, he saw the future. He decided to produce me and another girl called Two Chicks, and um, we produced a couple songs. One was um, Bad Dreams in Hollywood, and. Yes, you can look up the, the video from the 80s of us awesome. that he produced, and it is worth the look because it couldn't be more quintessentially 80s if, if it tried, but it's, it's really wonderful. It's, it's wonderfully uh, vintage. <laughs> All right, I'm going to find it and link to it on the website. Okay. So just click through. Okay. That is awesome. Okay, yeah. It's Bad Dreams in Hollywood, and it's, it's like one of those songs. That, it's like a brain worm. Uh-huh. It's going to get in your head. And then we did French Kissing in the USA, which after we broke up, Vicky and I, um, Vicky, Vicky was into Scientology and it was a whole big thing in the Scientology, Scientology organization. When they, when we started to get some, you know, speed, they were like, well, she's not a Scientologist. So are you, you in or are you out? Yeah. And it's like, and she was like, well, Susie, just start taking some courses. And I go, no, you get a bat mitzvah and then we'll talk. <laughs> Cause first of all, I don't even know how to say the tahora, whatever it is, the hatora, haptora. So I'm not into this, okay? So she ended up moving to to Florida, and God knows what's going on with my my pal Vicky Tan, but she's there, and it broke us up, and it was sad. And then he tried to put me with someone else, and you know you have chemistry with mm-hmm. somebody. So that song became uh, Deborah Harry's comeback song. Oh my God! Yeah, so she sang, and it was exactly exactly like our our version of it. And because I actually was the one that told. Um, I told Chuck, I said, we should have guy background vocals because it would be so good. Uh-huh. And she used the same uh, male, vo- the background vocals. So, and then, so, so I, basically, Deborah Harry has your career. Yes. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? She's a bitch. Okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> She's actually not a bitch. She's so incredible. I actually did. So probably like, I want to say like 10 years after that, I did a, a role in a movie, a movie of the week that she played a high end madam. 
Uh, yeah. So I am in the, the, the wardrobe trailer and in walks Deborah. And I'm like, so I thought, okay, this is perfect. I'm, I'm just so excited to meet you. And you recorded uh, uh, French Kissing in the USA and she said, oh my God, you guys did the demo. She said, you should have re released it. It was so good. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, that's the way it goes. But it, so that oh was my kind of like my, my, my uh, six degrees of separation from Deborah Harry. Oh, how fun. Yeah. What a fun entree into the business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another career that yet another career. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then you went on to act, right? I, I was direct. acting and writing first. I was like, when I, I went to started taking scene study after the singing thing, and I also graduated from UCLA, and I, I majored in um, communications and linguistics, and which I really wanted to do journalism. Mm -hmm. So I wrote for the Bruin, but they didn't have a journalism major, so I did that. You know, that was the closest thing too. So then, when I started going out as an actress after I left that left UCLA, then I was reading all the scripts I was getting, and I thought I can write this better, <laughs> so, like you do. And so it's so funny. Someone else said I, I think it was Nels Govell uh, on the show was like I was inspired by the mediocrity. Yeah, <laughs> Thank, Amen. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, you know, I thought, why not? You have this like you you have this youthful naivete and tons of energy. And, and why uh, not? And why not? So the guy who's still my very best platonic best friend to this day was in that acting class. And I said, hey, do you, do you write? Do you want to help me write this sitcom based on me and another girl? And he did. We got signed at William Morris. I got a deal at, what was it? It was the people that did One Day at a Time. And it's no longer in business. I'm trying to think. I can't think of the name of it. It, it doesn't matter. Anyway. It was Wait, a, from a spec script? You got signed with an agent and yeah, with a production company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were like, my friend and I were like... You're like, it's easy. This is so easy. <laughs> What's everybody bitching about? Like, <laughs> I have a career at like 22, okay? But like, it's hard. I mean, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and then nothing happened after that. <laughs> nothing happened. And um, like, we're like, what happened to our career? Like, we were yeah. so going, you know... We were amaze balls, and we couldn't get going. We were on a rocket ship. So I mean, so from there, I did I I did quite a bit of acting, and then I had a daughter, and that was also like that was interesting trying to be an actress with a with a baby, and I probably was I didn't know anybody else that had a baby because I had a baby young, uh -huh. so I had a baby you know before the age of twenty. <laughs> so you're trying to be the young ingenue and yes. have your baby in the Thank basket you. on the way. Yeah, yeah. You, you're very haiku with me, exactly. <laughs> because I would be, they, you know, I'd come back for the callback for the sexy girl, you know, blah blah blah. Yeah, and they go, that that's your baby. Do you have to bring her in? To that, and I go, and it, so it's like, I do? yeah. And they're like, well, that kind of kind of blows the whole vision. <laughs> I go, yeah. so that was that was a bit of a challenge, and then. But we made the best of it. I mean, I mean, isn't that funny? Because they're wanting to put you in a box, and if you didn't, if you weren't holding your baby, they wouldn't know. But suddenly, they can't see you well, as yeah. the sexy young woman. Well, right, because you you plant, yeah, because you plant these like biased perceptions right. that people have. Because now you're the Madonna, exactly, and you can't be the whore, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's the same same with ageism. If you tell people your age, they go, oh, oh my, yes, oh, I thought you were this. Okay. Then it changes. Right now, I can't see you. I can't see you the way I thought you were. That's why we're we're forced to to lie lie <laughs> our asses off because because it's true. It's absolutely true. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. Well, or it's the topic. Or it's the topic. There's whole yeah. there's a whole lot of biases going on. No, it's funny, especially now with actors, like the whole Friends crowd, you know, is well into their 40s, if not 50s now. Oh, yeah. And it's still getting tons of roles sure. and out there. And everyone talks about it like it's this crazy unicorn thing. But you look at them, everyone is still vibrant, wonderful women. Uh, yeah. Like, they're what like, is the big deal? They're, <laughs> they're just starting. I mean, that's right. like, it, this is another chapter. Like, w w yeah, it's very interesting. I actually can't wrap my head around people retiring. I don't understand that concept because yeah. what's your purpose then? To sit on your barking lounger. <laughs> 
I it just to me, I'm just like, then you're just on a slippery slope and ready you to dig your own hole. I don't know. <laughs> just ready to die. Just ready to die. So uh, what, were you doing more acting than writing, or were you doing it all at the same time? I was doing it at the same time. I, I wrote, I did some, I just started out in children's, so I wrote for Disney, and we did a series of um, international children's programming for Disney, started mm-hmm. with that, and then I was writing, I did a couple projects with this independent director, producer, Pierre David. I did three films as an actress with him. And then I, and then he was the one that said, you really are a good producer. You should produce and write and direct. And I said, and I took offense to it. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm an actress. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought, what, I'm not good enough to be an actress. <laughs> and now like, I hate going in front of the camera. I hate it so much. And my, in my short, I had to cast someone to play me because uh-huh. it was about my mom. And, and everyone's going, Jip. Just play yourself. Like, what's what? What are you doing? Like, there's no one better yeah. to play you. I'd much rather not be in front of the camera anymore. But oh, that's funny. Okay, yeah. let's talk about your short. Oh yeah, what's it called? It was called My Mom and the Girl. It is called My Mom and the Girl, based on my mom who uh, has Alzheimer's. She's mm. in fact, I'm going to go visit her after I speak with you. Oh, I'm sorry, that sucks. It sucks, and but that's the whole reason why I did this project because. Huh. It sucks so bad that mm. I wanted to show some way to find the light in it mm. and to find a way to journey it with someone that you love and make and make the most of it and find the joy in it because there is joy to be found once you surrender to it. Mm-hmm. And my mom, when I uh, ten years ago, I went through a horrific divorce, like the like just a gut wrenching divorce. Me too. Ten years ago. Yeah, it's a good year for very bad divorces. That- <laughs> Girlfriend, Ugh. that that's yeah. That was my second divorce, and there's nothing like that second divorce. My first husband, that was my babe when we were babies. Basically, we're still best friends, and he's the father of my first daughter. And the second one is a, a he. I call him my my goy toy. He was my British. My, he was a British import actor, narcissist. Like, and I'm not saying that in a very cliche way. I'm talking about clinical, s- clinical. Yeah, that I never even knew what the I never knew what narcissism meant. Oh, horrific divorces is because one of the people is a narcissist. Like, literally hasn't seen his daughter in ten years. Did you read that book, Splitting? Uh, How to protect yes. yourself from some, yeah, I've read while divorcing and I've read all of them. Yeah, for the first first two years after he left, I was anything that had the nar- the, the N word. <laughs> I I literally I didn't sleep for two years. I was like, what just happened in my life? Right. I had no clue who he was. I was the goddess. I was I was so connected to him. It was like crack. He was my crack. Mm-hmm. Just tell you that his first his first wife has been in a mental institution for the past fifteen years. Oh my god! And we just connected because that's my next project. Because people think they know narcissism, they don't unless you live it. And it is it is the most devious, soul eating, terrible, terrible psychotic makeup kind of person that you could ever be and around. insidious and slow. Slow. Because for, uh, I was just having this conversation on the way over here with this woman. And I said, because she was like, well, they know, and they know how to, to you know, push your buttons. And they, they're, they're, they really try to get at you. And I go, you, that's wrong. They don't try. They don't really care. They're on their own journey. You're in their movie. And if you're not playing the part the way they want you to, then they don't need you. Yeah. They don't really care. They don't think about you. If they don't call for two days, it's not because they're doing it to, to you know, piss you off. They don't, they're busy. They're doing their life. What's your problem? <laughs> like, why are you mad? How dare you? How dare you? And how do you think that makes me feel? Yeah. That hurts me when you say that. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <sighs> right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so you were in recovery from that. Like for 10 years, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's really yeah. Um, I don't. Do, are you into better things, Pam Adlin? Have you? Yes. Heard? Okay. So I got to meet her. Like she's like. I know everyone says this, and I know Pam. If you're listening, everyone says this, but you are the love of my life, and everyone can just eat it because I I get you. I know you. Like we've lived the same life. Yeah. Like okay. So Pam, if you are listening, please come on the podcast. please come on her show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's amazing. I met her at the writers' retreat, and and I'll, I'll have to show you pictures. Okay. You can I, tell she's the coolest. The, Beyond, like real, the real deal. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, you know that she had a narcissistic husband and, you know, like the, there's an episode where, from this season where she keeps awake. She's like this, it, it starts up this, like, you know, like a romp in the bed, just this crazy, wild, wonderful sex. And then she's waking up and she's like, shit, 
<laughs> shit, 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 because it's him. And I've done, I've done that so many times where I'm so bad at myself because I feel like I'm betraying me. Like, stop thinking about because him. Because you had a dream? Yes, stop yeah. it. I don't want to think about you. Like, get the hell out of my head. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, so that's what happens. They're like, they're like brain worms in there and you just can't I don't know how to get rid of it it's, it's very terrible. difficult it's terrible so let's move on from yes that. so the movie is based on the uh, after that divorce <clears throat> or during that divorce my mom who was already in a uh, lightly assisted with my stepfather who was 12 years older assisted living because he was in his late 80s at the time my mom was in her early 70s he was getting very ill and he ended up dying and mm. so <sighs> when somebody dies that has when somebody dies in someone's life who has Alzheimer's, it's so it's like Groundhog's Day. For you, have them. To, you have to tell her every day. Every her day, died. Every day. Horrible. Five times a day. Where's Georgie? Mom, he died. What? Why didn't anybody tell me? Oh. What is what is wrong with you people? And then in a loop all day mm-hmm. long. So I said, Do you ever choose just to not not tell her today? No, and I'll tell you why. I knew that eventually it would it would sink in. It would sink in, and I needed to. That was the hard part is waiting for it to get to in To sink there. in. And it finally did. Like, I remembered it so distinctly. She said, she says, where's Georgie? And I looked at her, I go, Mom. And she went, he died, right? And Aww. I said, yeah. So she got it. Yeah. So that was, you know, but that I moved her in. I was, I'd sold my house because he just left me with every bill, the mortgage. Here, darling, I can't pay for the new car. Here's the keys, too. Yeah. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. I'm running for my life now. <laughs> Walking towards my freedom. And <laughs> I moved into this work-live loft in, in um, Universal City. Uh-huh. Like you probably passed it on the freeway a hundred times. And, and in any oh, o- I've been there. It's off the Coenga. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're awesome. Yeah. In, in any other time of my life, it would have been my dream place. Yeah. <clears throat> Except I had my mom with Alzheimer's living there with me. Oh my God. So it was. It was. It was the biggest challenge of my life. So I, I call it the best and worst year of my life. My second daughter from from the a hole was um, sixteen at the time. And it was so hard. And we had the, my daughter's nanny who knew my mom because she was her housekeeper as well. And she was so sturdy with my mom because my mom's hilarious. Let's mm-hmm. just put that there. My mom was an a opera singer at nine. She was the most amazing pipes. And then met my father when she moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And he was in the music industry. And they met at a gig. And he fell in love with her you know, talent. And she recorded at on um, Capitol Records. It's just, I have so much history in that. So my mom is fearless and so special, five foot tall with, you know, a, a, just a bundle of smart just and not take and shit, challenging. but just like, but like if she loves you, she loves you. And if she doesn't get, I don't need you. <laughs> get out. Thank you. Get out of here. Yeah. But she had never a jealous bone in her body. Like she taught me that, like the most gorgeous woman could walk by my mom and go, stop and let me look at you. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's beautiful. You know, and that's, yeah. and, and most beautiful women are like, no one says that to them from another woman. They'd be like, and they're suddenly disarmed mm-hmm. and they're and it's such a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. My that's mom wonderful. taught me that. And, and to anybody, not just, you know, like yeah. when I would take her to well, her, no, that sisterhood. Yeah, my would she would we would be at at Kaiser and she'd be getting her blood pressure. You know, I'd take her there, and it would be this very dour a woman who looked dour and didn't just you know just going through the motions. And my mom would look up and go, "Do you have beautiful skin?" And she'd go, "Oh, thank you." We'll my mom, would, don't everything. thank me. Thank God. Look in the mirror and thank God. <laughs> and suddenly the whole there was a beautiful woman there. Yeah, she'd light up. But that that was the gift that I got to see hanging with my mom as an adult that much, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, and I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's. So that year was hellish. And then the biggest gift of my life. And I remember everyone used to say a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people would say, why are you putting your daughter through that? It's like, it's so hard because my mom would, she was at that feisty stage. Mm -hmm. She was fighting it. And I said, well, I need to hold her hand over the bridge. I need to, she's my best Mm -hmm. friend. I love her and I know her, we know each other. I mean, I tried to talk her out of it. I was like, trying to talk her out of it. I was like, Mom, you know me. Stay you have here, Alzheimer's. I'm like, let's just get rid of it. Yeah. I know you're bigger than this, this thing. We're going to get rid of it, Mommy. Because mm. you just don't believe it. You don't believe that this is happening. Like, or you think there'll be a time where she gets better and she comes back. This will be over. Like it's going to be an epiphany. She's going, oh, oh, that's what's happening. 
got it. Right. Yeah. So that was that was me, or it was like you know that 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 incessant thing that people don't know. No, I just there's this point where you go, you know, you think you can talk them, you like you can train them, and like you you keep. You can remind them. Yes, of you say, "Mom, I just told you that." Mom, I just told you that. Yeah. You know that. You know that. You know that. And I look at videos where I was doing that, and I want to smack myself because they can't. Right. And they just feel bad. They feel bad, and they get frustrated. You know. And it was that whole year of my mom going for not remembering that my daughters were her granddaughters mm-hmm. and thought they were my friends. Hmm. She go, "Well, oh, I see you're busy with your friends, so I'll find my. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll go home." And mom, you are home. Yeah, right. <laughs> and she'd start put her purse on and start taking everything that was hers. Yeah, I'll just take this <laughs> and I'll take this and I'll take that. You're like, where are you going? And I'm go. Okay, mom, these are your grandchildren. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then later, I would tell her, I go, mom, you can't do it. It's really hurtful. And she go, what I do? I tell her. She go, oh, and she cry. I would never Aww. do that. Which is what? How? It's sort of started the film. Well, let me back that up. My, our caregiver who was amazing, and I, I just want to give her so much props because it takes a village mm-hmm. to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's. You cannot do it alone. You just can't. And when she, she and I were, her name is Erlanda, and Erlanda and I were the first to really get that my mom was, something was going on. Because she would, Erlanda doesn't drive. She would take the bus all the way to Woodland Hills from East LA mm-hmm. every Tuesday to clean my mom's house. And like, it started right a year before where she would show up, ring the doorbell. My mom would go, what are you doing here? You were just here. What are you trying to get more money? <laughs> I'll see you next week. And Erlanda, I didn't know this till later. This is how cool. When you compared notes. And she, so Erlanda would go, hmm. so she'd wait 10 minutes and ring the doorbell again. My mom would go, Erlanda, you want a cup of coffee? Come in. Oh my God. I knew she was the one to help me. Yeah, she was the first one to know. She was the one. And she was so sturdy with her. If my mom was getting agitated, which is they do in that stage. Mm-hmm. Come on, nanny, let's go. Everyone called her nanny. Let's go, nanny. Come on, we got to go walking. She, they walked for hours. They'd walk everywhere. My mom knew everybody in the street. Everybody, like, you know, in Universal City. And, like, my place had a... a we had valet. It's like living at a studio. My mom would, when she first moved in, she'd go up to the guy in the valet go, um, can you get my Cadillac? And he'd, go, <laughs> <laughs> and he'd go, I don't think we parked your car. And she goes, the hell you didn't. I will have you sued. I will. I'm calling the fucking police. My mom never used to say fuck, right? Wait, was she kidding or was this part of the disease? No, that was part of the disease. Oh my God. So, um, and I was so embarrassed. And I was I was really embarrassed. I thought, what am I doing? I'm putting her in, like, first of all, for my, these are people that are potential colleagues and all this. And I thought, what am I doing? Like, very shortly, the valet people were, like, seamlessly got it. And they were like, good morning, nanny. How are you? And they go, where's my car? It's getting detailed. Uh-huh. You want to, uh, do you want to rush them? And then she'd be <laughs> like, Oh. And that they they got it. And when yeah. she left, when I had to put her in assisted living a year later, everyone missed her. Mm. Everyone. Like they were like, we miss her so much. Because who she was was always there. It was those moments. And everyone got it. Everyone yeah. accepted it. And everybody was, was, everyone rose to the occasion more than I ever thought that they would. That's nice. Because I didn't, I mean, I only experienced the other. Like I lost a brother out of it because he never did accept it. He couldn't take it. Yeah. He didn't, he couldn't step up. So is your film about that year? It's about a moment in that year. And I took a couple very relatable yet. I, you know, I thought, you know, very unique to me, but I thought it would be, it would relate. And I wanted to show a joyous look at it Mm -hmm. because I wanted to show when, as the filters start going away, they can see clearer sometimes. Um, So my Erlanda would come home with these anecdotes all the time, what my mom would do on the bus and how she was singing and all these things. My mom would, my mom used music a lot when she couldn't think of anything. They go, you know who I am? I know you are beautiful to me. And she'd just go into a song, right? And that was her, that was her hack for not remembering who they were. Well, they say that's the last thing that goes, right? The last thing. the music. I still use music. That's our, that's my key. That's your connection. That's my key. Gets right in. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, so this particular thing was so beautiful. Erlanda told me that my mom would go with her sometimes. We're Jewish. She would, take, she would, go, to, she would go to church in East L.A. with Erlanda on Sundays. <laughs> and, you know, the Latino community revere the elder. Not like, you know, most of us, you know, have not been taught. Yeah. We, like, put him away. We put him away. You know, yeah. 
And they were like, everybody, she was the grand dam. She was uh -huh. the la reina, the queen. So this particular weekend, she was, Erlanda said, can Nanny sleep over? And I said, sure. And she, she'd done this before. And we'd already downsized my mom, obviously. Erlanda had her dining room table. She had, we gave her so much because we didn't, I'd rather her have it than, you know. Right. So, and also my mom felt like, you know, it was familiar. So this one night, she got agitated. It was 10, 10 at night and she ended up like wanting to go home. And she bolted out the front door and Erlanda just went, grabbed her keys and her cell phone and followed after her. And cause she knew that the agitation would end mm -hmm. and that, you know, but, it, but if she tried to stop her, it would exasperate it. So, um, it culminated in my mom being somewhere in East LA on the corner, street corner, waiting for the light to turn green. And there was this transgender woman. Six, my mom's five feet tall, six foot two with heels. And, you know, this, I'll tell you like, briefly, this is the ending of the movie where she looks up at this woman and, she, and they're, they're looking at each other. It's like, what's your problem? Me? I don't got a problem. What's your problem? <laughs> and my mom was like, you want to know my problem? That bitch won't stop following me. That's a problem. <laughs> and so she was, and the transgender woman says, she goes, I don't know. And, and they're London, it's like, and she goes, I think, I think you might, I think that woman is your friend. And I think she's worried about, what are you talking about? You don't know my life. She goes, they've already stolen everything from me. Believe me, I've got nothing. And so she says, you got nothing. She goes, you want to know what nothing is? She goes, this fake. I'm doing a, I'm doing a very bad Latino accent because she was Latina. Okay. You're also doing gestures that people. Oh, can't right, see. right, right. <laughs> she's pointing to her face and she says, I, you see this fake. She go, points to her boobs. She goes, you see this? Fake. And my mom says, no. <laughs> and she goes, and, and she points to her package and goes, and this, you don't want to know what's going on down there. <laughs> and she goes, I don't got nobody that loves me. I never did and never have and never will. Mm. And my mom says, now you, st and, my, and she starts to cry, starts to cry. Transgender woman. Who does that at 10 o'clock at night? Just feels that open. My mom goes into mommy mode. And starts to wag her finger, looking straight up at her and says, now you stop that right now. Have you looked in a mirror? You are gorgeous. Aww. And she says, and if anybody doesn't say it or think it, they're just jealous or stupid or both. Beautiful. And she goes, and by the way, you're not alone because I love you. Beautiful. And she starts to cry. And yeah. she says, and they put, she puts her arms through and she goes, turns green, the light. She goes, you want to, you feel like something sweet? I do. Come on, let's go. So they start to walk across the street and the, and the transgender, I say transgender because we, my mom never got her name. Yeah. And she said, wait a minute, what about your friend? And my mom turns around and looks and she goes, Erlanda, what are you doing there? <laughs> she goes, she goes, I love her, but <laughs> that's the crazy sign around. Yeah. Yeah. I love her, but woohoo, you oh know, my God, that's and great. that, and I said, what a scene, what a scene. And it says so much. It's everything is in that scene. Everything. I still get the chills from it. And I, I said, oh, I have to do that. I have to tell the story mm -hmm. because she changed her life. And wherever this woman is, my mom only saw her as this gorgeous woman. And she's telling that story to everybody she can talk to. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. And, 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 you know, the story and then the beginning of it, it starts off with my mom giving me the worst night of, my, you know, one of the worst nights, just an exemplary of, of many nights of her mm -hmm. banging on my door at three in the morning, my bedroom door going, open the door, God damn it, open the fucking door. I know you're in there. We had to lock our doors because at some point, and, you know, and the voiceover is that that's my mom, that's my best friend, she's the love of my life. And then you, she goes, bitch, open the door. <laughs> It's so hard. So I open the door and I'm like, Mom, it's four in the morning. What are you doing? She says, Where's my baby? Did you steal my baby? You did, didn't you? That's a disgusting, despicable thing to do to steal someone's child. Like, I am your baby. You're, you got it. So oh I said, Mom, you don't have a baby. Oh, right. What'd you do? Sell her? Oh, you sold her, didn't you? And then she starts to walk and she's going to go find. I go, Where are you going? It's like, because it was, it's like four levels, mm -hmm. the, the loft we lived in. So I'm going to find my baby. So I follow her down and we end up on one landing and I go, mom, stop. And she turns around and there's moonlight and she looks at me and she goes, oh, you're my, you're my baby. She says, you have to put me in a home. 
you have to live your life. And I said, oh, you're going. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, but like we're all having a moment yeah, yeah. right now. Yeah. And yeah. I said, but um, not yet. You're not ready and I'm not ready. And that's the movie, basically, you know? I so it really it. shows both sides. And, and I just want to add one thing in case anyone doesn't see it. But you should see it because Valerie Harper plays my mom. And she, d- and she Where can we see it? You can see it on, on Amazon Prime, on, U- on um, iTunes, on Google. It's on PBS all the time. They okay. play it. I'll link to that, too. Okay, great. And I'm going to watch it as soon as it, Yeah, it's 20 minutes, but I tell you, you'll, you'll laugh, you'll cry. And not because I'm my filmmaking, which is wonderful. No, but I mean, not to say it's just it just is a magical little piece. And Valerie Harper and Liz Torres, if anybody remembers Liz Torres, she plays Irlanda and it's just wonderful. And um, just the whole cast is really lovely. And, the, the you know, the girl that plays um, Harmony Santana plays. She is a transgender actress. She's beyond my my wildest dreams that I, I was so happy to, ha- to have her. So Okay, well, we're all in. Say the title one more time. My Mom and the Girl. My Mom and the Girl. We're all watching that. Yeah. That is great. Thanks. Okay, now tell me what you're working on now. You just told me you spent the last three weeks getting ready for your application. To- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, prior to that, last year I was hired to write an, an adaptation from a book called Plain Jane, which was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I had never done an ab- adaptation. I had been, I had pitched for one and was, but I never actually got to do it. And, you know, it seems easier than it is because, oh, you, the story is there, but it's really not because a novel is not written like a film. Oh yeah. It doesn't sound easy to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think from a, from my point of view, I, I guess maybe it's just me, but I thought, well, you know, it's all there. All the ingredients are there. Right. Now you, you just write out the dialogue. Exactly. You have to figure. Yeah. No, you have to figure out a real movie. Yeah. You know, with a, with an arc, and because books meander, and they go over here, and they go over there. And if books were movies, they'd be twenty hours long. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So it was interesting when I got it. Uh, my daughter was just going through IVF, and I didn't know anything about IVF because I got pregnant the first time I had sex. <laughs> Can we be like? I feel very close to all of you, so let's talk about this. <laughs> I'm the walking, I'm the, I'm the poster child for birth control. <laughs> you are the fertility goddess. Yes, I am. So I, this is the polar opposite for your daughter. To polar be opposite. This. Like I, the word, the like, P. Try having sex. Yeah. That should do it. That, honest to God, like every time I had unprotected sex. Oh, yeah, same, same. Same. Same thing. We're same. like, okay. So my daughter, on the other hand, she has, she was already going through her second IVF transfer. I didn't really know much about it. The night before the book came, I decided I should watch some. I, there was a documentary on about IVF, and I didn't know what even what a transfer was. And I watched it, and the next day when I got the book, it was well. I say the story is very much like Wild Meets Juno. Oh, so it's this woman's journey on her first marathon at the New Jersey Marathon. So it all takes place as she's running it. In in retrospect, looking at how she got where she's at running towards either the end of a lot of her, of the life as she knows it or not. So she's reviewing her life as she's running the marathon? Yeah. Yeah. And so she had, the, in this book, in one of the, the threads, the main thread has to do with IVF. I can't, I can't tell you everything because we're in the middle of setting it up. Yeah. But it, but it so spoke to me. Yeah, and I, I thought, want to watch it. And I was like, I need to, this is my book. This yeah. is my story. I need to work with this woman. And it was I, I interviewed with her on the phone. She's in New York. And it was like, within 10 minutes, she goes, you're my writer. And it was meant to be. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can't say anything more than that other than a, a, an Academy Award winning producer already has picked it up. And I'm hoping to direct Wonderful. it. And that's where we're at on it. And I can't say anything more. And I want to because I love this project so much. But it's called Plain Jane. And if you want to read the book, it's out. And it's Barry Levitt and he wrote it. And she's an incredible woman. And um, that's it. Exciting. Yeah, it's a really, it's a great book. And it's not just about that, the other part. The, like, it's really about a, a modern moral dilemma that we wouldn't have had even 10 years ago. Mm. And so it's a, it's a great journey. And then, yeah, the last three weeks, I've been working on a, on a brand new pilot that I wrote called, it's a, it's auto fiction, like the kids say, <laughs> and, um, which is, uh, autobiographically driven. 
half hour sitcom um, called Single Ever After. Mm -hmm. And I was, I decided to write it something that I, I, it's been simmering forever since I'm, since, (laughs) since I met my best friend at 19 who happens to be a red blooded male and not gay. He's straight. He's platonic. We're platonic (laughs) friends forever and nobody can wrap their head around it. Yeah. And now I live with him. Oh, how funny. And I've been living with him for five years platonically, but we're like a family. We're family. We're as close to a marriage. He's your soulmate. We're best. We're best friends. We don't like I like. If you ask me, have you slept? No, ew. <laughs> no, we're we're like beyond. We're friends. We're brothers and sisters. Yeah. And we never met on that level. Mm-hmm. Although he did ask me out. That's how I first met him. But I was married at the time. But that's how it started. So that didn't work out. And that didn't work out. But we were best friends. Like, where do you live? And so, you know, shut up. I live in Sherman Oaks. Let's carpool. <laughs> <laughs> best listener ever. And still is. He's a poor guy. He's like, he's in line for sainthood. He's been through all my divorces, everything. So the pile, the whole project takes place on, you know, so it's after a woman who's had two children, two divorces, and now is living single ever after together. I love it. And that's, that's the project. I'll buy it. Isn't it, doesn't it sound interesting? <laughs> yeah. No, it's super fun. And then what's so funny is that. Except the audience is going to want you to get together at the end of the I season. I know. Everyone's. At the end of every season. Yes. And they still do. It's like, I was telling you when you were first setting this up, like on the way over, I had a, a colleague that was talking to me about another project. And I told her I finished this thing for uh, the submission for Ron Howard's Imagine Impact, which will, it's a game changer. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a project incubator and it's just him and him and Brian Grazer and it's a game changer, but it's the process for submitting is hellish. It's hella hard. And it's literally like three weeks of your life. Yeah. Like if you do a good job but and it's I not just, as hard as producing a television show. No, it's not. It'll get you ready. That'll get you ready. And also I think, um, I've, you know, I've challenged myself by writing this project at the same time. And I thought this, this feels like a good motivation to do it. So, but interesting is that my, the friend that I was talking to said, um, so can I ask you a personal question out of nowhere? She goes, so are you, you and Don are like a, a couple, right? And I said, no, but tell me, ask me more. <laughs> and I said, and she goes, oh, well, so then he's gay. <laughs> and I go, and this is like the whole of our lives has been like, are you sleeping together? Oh, you're not. He's gay. No, he's not well, gay. See, now I want to talk to Don and get the real scoop. There. And the, he's the real scoop. And it's so funny. And his, on his side, he's literally gone out with dudes that'll go, so what? So you're living with Susie? How's that? <laughs> and he's like, fine. You know, it's, it's great. I'm getting used to her dogs. Yeah. Like, I've never they're had what? dogs. And they're like, well, you're, you're fine, right? And he's like, no. Why is she there? Wow. Because she's my friend. We're roommates. Well, that's does, all she's good for. Does she, does she cook at least? Wow. And he, you know, and Don is like, I always say he's, the, he's the, he's the gayest straight person I know because you can talk to him about any, like he just is so, he is so in touch with the female chemistry, the female, you know, mm-hmm. what perspective and he gets it. And that like, like his, he, he, oh, he sounds great. He's awesome. But you know what? There's a time where, like, well, people say we're like an old married couple because most most old couples don't have sex anyway. So, <laughs> and we don't have any baggage. We just like each other. We have fun. We, but then, we, do you both date other people? Mm-hmm. Well, I do. He doesn't. <laughs> I think that would be hard to be in that relationship. See, so that's see, that's another perfect thing. This is why it's so a great it's a great project because people want to know. Like in my pilot. I, so my daughters, let's backtrack. My daughters decided I needed to get out. Mm-hmm. And so this is, I'm not even kidding you. Like three months ago, they put a profile up on Hinge and Bumble. <laughs> what was the other one? Coffee meets bagel. Mm-hmm. I was like, are you guys effing kidding me? Like, no, I don't like these things. It's the worst. It's the worst. I don't want it. Mom, this is how I met. I, one of them met her husband that way. And I was like, yeah, that's different. You guys are young and you don't have baggage and it's very transparent. No and no. Right. They did it. And and the profile was so horrible. It like she was like, I like to sing around the piano. I crochet. I'm like, who when did I ever crochet? Two years ago. That's not even a hobby. I did one, one thing, time. One I time. One Mom, time. you did it. I go, why would you put that? How about director? How about like hip hop dance? What's wrong? Make me cool. Okay, so cut to Life's a crochet, long walks on the beach. Uh huh. Totally. No, no, it wasn't even as good as that. It was likes to sit on the couch and binge Netflix with someone I love. What? Okay, so 
Terrible. I went they on. They did you no favors. I went on three, three, just to just to try, and I thought, and all of them were in the industry, and I thought, well, if it doesn't work out, I've made a connection. Yeah. So this this is this is the one that I wrote about. I put it. I put this in the last part of the pilot where and this really happened. I met the guy after hip hop class. I said he called me and he goes, so um, we should meet for coffee. And I go, he goes, where do you live? And I said, oh, I live near Culver City. But I'm headed towards Studio City. That's where I take my dance class. Well, I'm there now. Let's meet after. And I go, I'm going to be a sweaty mess. Yeah. He goes, I'd rather see you like that. He's like, even better. Even better. I'm like, hmm, that's not, that's kind of cool. So we meet at Starbucks, which was closing by the time I got there. So we ended up, you know, I saw him. He was like practically in the parking lot. If anybody lives in Studio City, they know this, where the Rouse is. And um, I get out of the car. I see him. And the first thing he does is this. And ruffles my head like a five, what? like he, like I'm his five year old nephew. No, how you doing? No, no. Oh yeah, he did. No. Oh yes, he did. Uh-huh. Disqualified. Oh yes, he did. And then he went on. We sit down. He goes, oh, you know what? You're easy to find on social media. I'm like, okay. And he goes, uh, yeah. He goes, uh, you got a, we got a lot of, you know, quite a few people in common. And starts going on Facebook and showing me his two ex wives and his, how beautiful they are. And then he shows me his. He goes, you know, my daughter's 24. She's retiring now. She's a, she's a top model, and she works with all. And he starts. And he doesn't just show me one picture of her. I get like the whole file on his phone and he's waiting for like responses to each photo. I'm like, mm-hmm, beautiful, tall, <laughs> nice boots. Great. That's a new hairdo. I like, like I'm on and on and on. It was so Trumpy. And so then uh, we're finally finished. I can't get, I cannot wait to get out of there. And so he goes, well, it, this was great. He goes, and you know, at least you got a cup of coffee out of it, right? Wow. And I said, you did not just say that. Wow. And he goes, that was pretty bad. I go, so cut to, I went to the writer's retreat. I told you where Pam, uh-huh. Pamela was there. And I go, and Don's with me, my partner. He's a writer too. And we go, we're in the first, uh, there's the first night mixer thing, you know, with drinks and everything. And I freaking see that guy. No. <laughs> and I say to Don, I go, go look at his room and see if it says... And that, that's his name. Go yeah. look at his name tag. He goes, puts thumbs up, goes, you know, sneaks, sneaks a peek and puts a thumbs up. So I go around and I go, hey, <laughs> and I ruffle his hair. No. And I go, remember me? How do you like that? And he goes, oh, I didn't do that to you. And I go, oh, yeah, you did. You did. And he goes, well, you had a cap on. I go, and? 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 Yeah, sit down, have a drink. I go, yeah, no. No. That was all I wanted to do. That was a great. It was such, it was such, so great. So, yeah, so there was that. And in the, you know, and so Don goes through all that with me. There, he's, he's my bud. It's like, I literally can say to him, is that the guy? That's great. And he's like, yeah. Everyone so, should have a Don. Everybody, I recommend a Don. Don't take mine though. Can't have mine. Get your own. Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> but you'll love him. Everybody does. You can't help but love him. My, my kids call him Uncle Don and he is Uncle Don. He is the nicest, you know, he's ridiculously nice and talented and he's an editor and just, Good. Good person. And so, good. And seen. Tell me about Go Girl Media. Right. So Go Girl Media, uh, just it's just my company. It, it started it after I worked at a uh, with my first mentor, Eric Van Lowe, who had a company called Sweet Lorraine Productions, and he was he still is my mentor. He's my he's my second dad. Um, he was the first African American showrunner. He started on the Cosby Show, and um, I went to pitch to him, and he said, "What?" I like all these projects and I hate everything because I'm not going to buy them. I want to hire you. And so, yeah, so I came in as like his director of development and then I worked my way up. And then um, long story short, he he had to close the company after a a deal went south because everything was self, you know, uh, financed financed and it it was a, a bad time. So I just started Go Girl Media. I wanted to do projects that, that, you know, focused on female protagonists or had, you know, something at the bottom of it that people hadn't seen before, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and cause I, when I was at Sweet Lorraine, everything I did was female oriented. We did a, a, a show called Pajama Rama for tweens. It was the view for tweens. Mm-hmm. And we had like 
so many, we had a, like a whole season in the can and then that was part of the whole bad scene. Like we lost, we lo- he lost the financing, but we had already shot a lot and we had, we had so many great guest stars. We had Shia LaBeouf and we had Raven Simone. We had uh, John, John Voight, <laughs> which was crazy. And everybody had to come in their pajamas. Oh, how fun. Yeah. So it was basically a big pajama party, but it was about, you know, it was, it was tweens and all their issues. Yeah. So everyone had to come and That's great. share their, their, you know, they're, awkward t- they're teen tween photos. Angst. Yeah, that's great. And we had our own Dr. Phyllish kind of person, mm-hmm. this woman. So it was a great project. And then I just started writing everything with females just because I liked the stories and they're things that I could relate to. You wrote on that Disney show, the dance show. Oh, yeah, Dance Revolution. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think my kids didn't miss an episode of Shush, that. Shush, really? So we wrote, yeah, that was my first television. That and Cake. Mm-hmm. They ran in a, in a, in a um, it was a, Block, a female block. It was called, it was oddly enough called the, the Super Slumber Party. Secret Super Slumber Party. Um, yeah, because I had just come off of Pajama Ramos. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was ironic. And that was my first two shows that I begged David Brookwell and Sean McNamara. I was helping them on a couple of projects. They had massive fame from Disney, like, you know, all those shows from Disney, That's So Raven, and even mm-hmm. Stevens, and yada, yada. And we met, and we had that, the same kind of energy. Most m- More Sean and I, just he's a big teddy bear and full of joy and loves children, and so do I. And um, he got this offer from Deke and from CBS to do this female, this block, tween block. And I was like, me, me, pick me, pick me. (laughs) Can I please, can I please write on it? Please, please, please. So we got it. We got Cake. We had to do, Cake was the sitcom and it had a, it had a, like an upcycling kind of project that you would do to a craft that would be the it would solve the problem mm. for, of that particular episode. And I'm a big crafty person. So it was perfect for me. I, I loved it. And um, we were writing that. We got hired for that first. And that was 13 episodes that had to be delivered in a horrendous, like, four-week period. And like, oh, it's just, it was so much work. Oh, my God. And then we were shooting both shows on one big stage, one side and then the other. And then CBS said, we, we don't like the right what's coming in on Dance Revolution. We love cake. Can we talk to Susie? So Sean called me down on the set with the CBS people, and, and they said, we don't want to know if you would run you know, Dance Revolution as well. And that was that was 26 episodes, and I was like, <laughs> yes, and yes. Okay, I guess. Yeah, okay, if you want me to. And Don wanted to kill me because we had to deliver so much and it, but it was, you know what? We got, we, we got hazed and we did it. We did it. We did it. And it was great experience. And so I can only thank Sean McNamara and David Brookwell for, you know, giving me an opportunity. Um, I'm, you know, I wasn't WGA at the time, so no residuals. And the only residuals I get is that I wrote the theme song for Cake. <laughs> did you get that? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Cause I hated the theme song that they were giving us. And I said, it's horrible. I'm going to rewrite it. Yeah. I wrote one and oh, that was they smart. loved it. Yeah. So yeah. So that that and then after Sean after Dance Revolution and Cake, Sean got hired to direct Bratz for Lionsgate. Mm-hmm. And then he called me and he said, Hey, do you know anything about these dolls? They're <laughs> called Bratz. And I go, Oh my God. How have, do you not know about that? Have Bratz? you seen the way I dress? <laughs> Sean, this is me. I am your girl. He goes, I need you. So I came in and I, I started as an associate producer. This is a great story for writers. And this is my, one of my favorite stories. And this is how I got into the WGA. Um, Avi Arad of, of Marvel fame, who got Marvel back on its feet, executive producer, you know, no filter whatsoever. And they were, they were interviewing when I came on board. They were already like in callbacks for the main four girls. And we were doing the callbacks. And after each one, Avi was like, Piece of shit. All of them. Every one of them. They're terrible. Who? What's going on here? They stink. <laughs> and I said to Sean, I go, Sean, they, they don't stink. It's just they don't have enough in the sides. Uh-huh. There's just not enough there. It's very glib. And I said, do you want me to write a couple sides, like, like a funny one and then kind of a warm one? He said, you want to? And I said, why not? So I did. And the next callbacks, Avi loved them all. And he said, what these sides come from? They're great. <laughs> and that's my really bad Israeli accent. And um, Sean said, Susie wrote it. He goes, fire that other bitch. She's hired. <laughs> and that's how I got it. Um, that's great. But cut to the, I just want to tell you, that here's the sad part is that I lost arbitration in my very first, because that bitch that he fired, 
hired a lawyer and none of my script was her script, but I lost. So she got the credit. Did you keep the job? Oh, I kept the job. I wrote, I was already writing the second, I was already writing the second, uh, the sequel. Oh boy. But that got you in the WGA. Mm -hmm. So they had to pay both of you. They, I don't, I get no residuals off of it. She, uh, she got the credit. Oh my God. And my name was already on the poster in the movie theaters. They had to pull all the posters because everyone knew. I mean, Lionsgate was there on the set all the time. I was the writer. Oh my God. Avi was, was calling me from, cause he was on the circuit for, uh, the junkets for, uh, Spider-Man at the time. So he'd mm-hmm. be calling me from Japan. Susie, I want to, I want to know if we can do this in this scene. Because <laughs> he's, he's fanatic. And nobody, I mean, Avi was not easy to work with. And Avi and I got along just really, really well. Like peas and carrots. Like peas and carrots. That's right. I was just going to say that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, what do you make of what has happened with women in the last three years? That's a big question. Um, I did I did two documentaries for WGA for Women's History Month, two, the uh, year before last and then last year, called Women Who Wrote the Way and then Breaking Good. Women that, that wrote the way was our sort of, you know, celebrated legends from Phyllis Nagy to Tina Fey and how they broke through the glass ceiling. And then the last Nora one, Ephraim. I didn't get Nora Ephron, but I'd love to, I'd love to have had her, but I had a lot of other incredible writers that told their stories and were so generous about it mm-hmm. that if you just Google it and you'll find it. It's there. If not, you'll, I'll give you links to it because it's, even if you don't write, these women are amazing. And, and, and it's very universal because I'll just give you one little nugget. I asked them all, what's been your biggest, uh, obstacle in your career? And down the line, every single one of them said me themselves. Meaning? Meaning they were their biggest obstacle, their self-doubt, their, you know, restrictions. They on, got in their own way. They got in their own way, which doesn't happen with most men. Mm-hmm. That's not, if you ask a man what their biggest obstacle, it would be, well, I was dealing with an asshole. Uh, I just, I didn't get the right opportunity. Um, they didn't like this and they're jerks. And that's the difference. Yeah. It's always outside of them. So, and we create our own. It's so interesting because the work is always twofold. One, the doors need to be open. And Mm -hmm. two, we need to do our own inner work and unravel all that conditioning that causes us to doubt ourselves every minute. A hundred percent. But it's hard because the biases are out there Mm -hmm. and, you know. And then they're reinforced. Yeah. And this, this is my segue into what, what I feel my, my issue with the past three years is, yeah, it's great. And we're very, um, there's, there's a conversation and it's very vocal and we're still screwed because women sabotage women. It's, it just happens. And it's very, it's, 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 it's not popular to talk about, but it's still out there. And Do you wi- think that's shifting though? No, not yet. I think that there's, I think the women that were always supportive, like I've always been a supportive woman. I don't have, I feel like if you're doing well, I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. And I just, I know that. I know that to be a a fact. And you can't be jealous of anybody else because they're do, they're doing what they do and what you, you know, they're not taking away from what you do. Just, it's just science. And I mean, I'm telling everyone who will listen, like we're not doing catty catty bitches anymore. No, we're done. No, but it, but it's still out there. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is just imprinted and it's like, you know, it's this unconscious bias of other women. Some of it is cultural and then some of it is just the way we're wired, Mm. you know, not all of us, but a lot of us. And some people grow out of it and some people don't. You see it in (laughs) assisted living. You can see the mean (laughs) girls there and there's mean girls there and they have their click. And they're doing, they're looking the, you know. Oh my God. I don't, it's, it is, it, it just is. It's, it's sad. It's embarrassing. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. And it's, and it's, it's so bad. I, there's a documentary that came out of London called Boys Alone. Mm-hmm. And then they did a follow up called Girls Alone. And it was like uh, a, a documentary that was based on like Lord of the Flies. Mm-hmm. So they put these, a dozen little boys from 10 to 11 years old in a house for a week by themselves. Oh God. And what was interesting was, and this is in London, they got a lot of flack, but it was so great. And so here, so when, I'm just going to give you this example, because this really paints the picture of the difference between men and women. So right away, the whole society starts, you know, forming and you got your, you got your, you know, leaders and your followers and your, your worker bees and and your tough guys and all that stuff. So they were doing, they were having a barbecue outside and, and, you know, the, the, the leader of the pack 
was sitting at the head of the table, and then he had his dudes around there, and one of the you know, worker bees sat in the wrong chair, right? And he goes, he's like, dude, that's, you can't sit there, you know, that's not, you see, he's like, cool, no problem. And he just goes and sits down at the other seat, right? So they did the same experiment in Girls Alone, and they had the queen bee and all her minions, and, mm-hmm. and one of the girls that, you know, did not deserve to be in their <laughs> purview at all sat at the wrong seat, and they all looked at her and went, are you sitting there? okay, there you go. I mean, that's the difference. It's just that passive, aggressive, not, you know, fil- filtered to the max. And we're going to shun you, but you're not really going to be able to put your finger on it. Exactly. We're going to let you stay there in but- hell. But feel our wrath. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're going to sit there. Great. <laughs> and now regret this, it. this girl is feeling terrible. I mean, we, she doesn't, because you got to fill it all in. Yeah. You have to fill it all in. And I've been through this so much in this industry from other women, and I've been women that stepped up for me and then women that didn't, that literally sabotaged an incre- incredible projects because of their own shit. And it's blatant, and it, um, it just is. I, I just is. It's well, out let's there. knock it off. We have to knock it off. We yeah. have to knock it off because, you know, it's like, that's what I love about my mom. Going back to my mom, it's like, let's look at the pe- let's look at everybody and like love and you know love their their great yeah. things about them. You got great see their feet. Beauty. Let's see your like love your that I'm I'm gonna love your great feet and your great. You, I I need a pedicure so bad. Like you have. There's Oasis down the street on Magnolia. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like <laughs> why not? And like if somebody's got great hair, love their hair. And if someone's got great eyes and they're you know Sharon Stone used to be my friend. I used to do improv. And she was in my improv class and, you know, God love her. She could be a bitch, right? But she loved me. I don't know why, because I guess, I don't know. She just liked me. And she was so confident and so beautiful. Like I could barely look in the mirror next to her, right? I was like, <laughs> I have to avert my eyes. I was like, oh, that, mm, I thought I was pretty. Wait, <laughs> there's a whole nother level of pretty here. And she was like, Susie, you need to pull all your hair back. You have an amazing face. What's wrong with you? I want to see your face. And I'm like, I, you know, but not, but just like, I love to, you know, I yeah. love to hang out with tall, lengthy leg girl, whatever, you know, but I didn't, I think she knew that I had nothing, no jealousy. Mm-hmm. It was fine. I just, I liked her. She was a hoot. I love it. Yeah. So that's, I mean, you know, we just need to, 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 that's something we all need to work on. And I think that's, I think if we are authentically, if we can get that shit out of the way, and if you have that shit, like, acknowledge it, mm-hmm. and, like, let's all call each other out on it, because that's the only way. Like, I remember what, when I was going out with some girls on, like, a girl night, my dancing buddies. I didn't really know them that well, but I knew them from dance class, and we went and did a girls' night out. And we're walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and one of the, I'm kind of trailing behind a little bit, and there was a little pack of, you know, younger, young, young girls, like, all dressed up, waiting to get into the troubadour. And as my, one of the girls walks by, you see her go, and walks. All right, you're giving her the up and down look. Thank you. Okay. And I, I was like, oh, I just. I did not just see that. I just We're not didn't. doing that anymore. So I went up Stop. to her and I said, oh my God, you just gave her the stink eye like all the way, like a full on up, <laughs> down and around. She goes, I did. I go, yes. I go, yeah. And I, I just called her out on it. I love it. And I just said, you can't, that's so, you can't do that. We're not doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. Stop. All right. What advice, what other advice do you have for young women coming up? Oh my God. For, well, I always say that I am a, I'm a feminist. I'm a feminine feminist, and, and I, I like my femininity. I celebrate that. Mm-hmm. And that's what I don't, I don't deny it, but I'm also, I also, so I, I lean into what my strengths are. Those are my strengths. Mm-hmm. And I write about what I know, and I write about, you know, all the things that go along with my makeup and what makes, you know, what are my trials and tribulations. So I would say, if you're a writer, write what you know, because not, not that you can't write other things. I've also just finished a, a whole epic series called the, on, based on the Vestal Virgins. But I still relate to these. There's, they're women. Mm-hmm. It's like sex in the city in, in ancient Rome. So, yeah, nobody knows about these women, so I'm going to get this sold. But, you know, but, but write about things that you like and that you're passionate about because then it will stand out. And do your own projects. Like, Take, take responsibility for your, for your life and your journey because no one else is going to do it for you. 
you know, and there's so, you guys, all of you young people, there's so much, there's so much opportunity to get yourself out there where there wasn't before. When I first started out, there wasn't like you had, there were gatekeepers, mm -hmm. so many gatekeepers. You don't have, you can get out there on Instagram and uh, on YouTube and the anywhere, Facebook. Facebook, everywhere. There's like, you can get out there. And if you're good, the cream rises. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Just do it. And, and you know, if you love it, if you don't get out because it's hard. Yeah. What didn't we talk about that we should have talked about? What should I have asked you? Nothing. I don't know. what I have no other advice. Love yourself. I'm learning to it. love it. Can I leave with one thing? Yeah. This is my favorite story. So, okay. So I was trying to exercise myself from my ex and I didn't know how, and I'm not a big therapy person, but I met this woman at the uh, Alliance of Women Directors that I belong to. And she's also a psychotherapist. And um, she said, come do a session with me. And um, so she was going to try to hypnotize me and mm -hmm. like, and I thought, oh, kind of like, um, you know, what's that movie with um, Jim Carrey? The so Eternal Sunshine. Yeah, Eternal Sunshine. Spotless Spotless it's like that. I wanted her to erase him from yeah. my brain. So she's trying to, she's trying to hypnotize me and I'm, I'm so, un I can't be hypnotized. I don't know why, but I just can't. I was trying really hard. I was like going down. The, That's probably like, why you can't try really yeah, hard. Yeah, I was just trying really hard. I'm going to do it really I'm going to well. do it. And then I was like, I'm still not. Because <laughs> she was like trying to like, you know, so now you're doing this. So then I go, I can't do this. And she goes, okay, let's try another route. And she said, um, uh, let's talk about, this isn't about your ex. It's about you and how much you love yourself. We want to get, let's get into that. Tell me how much you love yourself. And I go, are you kidding? Like, that's really weird to me. Like, I can't say, I, oh, I love me. I'm just yeah. like, love a me. <laughs> I can't do that. Like, that just seems odd. Like, me, myself is, mm, mm, mm. Yeah. I just can't. I found it silly. And she goes, got it. Okay. She goes, let, I'm not going to, let's not try hypnotism. She goes, but let's close your eyes. And I want you to think about Susie at a young age a little girl that you comes up into your memory and something and tell me about her. And I said, Oh, well, okay, that's easy. I'm five years old. I've got curly, curly, curly blonde hair and it's wild and it's everywhere. And I'm playing with my best friend, Michael, and we're playing house and he doesn't want to play house anymore. And I said, okay, then I'm going to go home. And so I just left. And he was like, cause he was being mean. And I said, you're just being mean right now. So I'm going to go home. I don't want to play with you. And so I go home and she goes, so you just left. Like you didn't care that he was, because he wasn't, it wasn't good for you, right? So you just left. I said, yeah. And she's, and we talked a little bit more about that. And then she goes, um, so do you love this little girl? And I go, I do. She's, I do. She's a feisty little thing. And I like her. And she's wearing this striped shirt and she's just all that. And she's just, mm, mm, mm. And she goes, you're letting her down. Mm. And that was the most, that was probably the greatest advice I ever got. Because she had no question about her worth and how she should be treated. And she said, you are letting her down. And that hit me. Man. I still get chills from that. Because, and so, ladies and gentlemen, don't let your younger self down. They're counting on you. They're looking up. Remember when you were five and you looked up and went, I'm going to be, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be that because I'm this and I'm good. You are good. You're good. That's it. I think we're done. You are a delight. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Susie Singer-Carter for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowley, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. And the merch really is coffee tumblers, but they're very cool. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms and go subscribe to catchabreakpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.